Like one of my favorite players in the NBA right now is TJ McConnell. All right, just do it. TJ McConnell is right. like. He's like Draymond but a guard. Yeah, he's like Draymond as a, as a point guard. Yeah. He is. I'm talking about TJ McConnell, one of my favorite players. Yeah. In the NBA. TJ, he's like a. There's certain guys that check into the game and it changes the flow of the game. Yeah, for sure. Peyton Pritchard's like that. Peyton Pritchard. Ish Smith was like that. Ish Smith was like that. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah, for sure. Welcome to episode four of Mind the Game podcast with LeBron James and me, JJ Redick, presented by Uninterrupted and 342 Productions. This discussion is centered around space in the NBA and how to exploit that space, icons in women's college basketball, and of course, one of the most famous defensive plays in NBA history, told through the mind, the eyes, and the words of LeBron James. Just a few things that we cover conceptually in this episode. I wanna go through these right now just to give you guys a little precursor to the concepts that we talk about. One of the things I talk about in this episode is the screen assist. Uh, assists are tracked and have been tracked for decades in the NBA. An assist is when a player passes the ball to another player and that player scores. A screen assist is simply acknowledging and documenting that a player has set a screen for another player who then scores. So it's Kevin Garnett with a wide pin down screen for Ray Allen who comes off that screen and hits a jumper. It's Derek Lively setting a high pick and roll screen for Luka Doncic who then makes a three pointer. A screen assist is just an opportunity to get your teammate open, who then scores. One of the best screen assisters in the entire NBA is Rudy Gobert, and he has been for a number of years. He actually leads the NBA in screen assists. This is a stat that is tracked through advanced stats. However, I think this should be a box score stat, and I explain why in this episode. The other type of assist we talk about in this episode is the hockey assist. So in hockey, if a player passes the puck to another player who then passes the puck to a goal scorer and this, the scorer scores the goal, he gets an assist. A hockey assist is simply the pass that leads to a pass that leads to a score. For example, in high pick and roll, if the ball handler comes off and makes a pass to the big man on the short roll, which we covered in episode three, and the short roller passes to the wing, and the wing guy sw swings to the corner for an open three, then the big man in the short roll who made the first pass, that's a hockey assist. So the Gortat screen. This is named after one of my former teammates, Martian Gortat, who popularized this type of screen and this concept uh, in the modern NBA. So if we talk about a spread pick and roll right here, and you have five offensive players and five defensive players. In today's NBA, the X5, the five guarding the five men on the offense, he's oftentimes in drop coverage. Drop coverage is simply the big man in a pick and roll dropping into the paint. He's not at the level. The level of the screen is at the level of the offensive player setting the screen. Drop coverage is simply your back off of the level. So a Gortat screen is when the offensive player comes around the pick and roll, the defensive player goes over the top of the pick and roll. And at this point, the offensive player has an advantage and as LeBron calls it, a hostage dribble or putting a player in jail. He keeps the defender on his back. Instead of rolling to the rim, this screener rolls into another screen on the drop coverage big, which allows the ball handler to get all the way to the basket. That is something that Martian Gortat ran a ton with John Wall, 
something I first really noticed when I went to Philadelphia and I played against the Boston Celtics a bunch, Daniel Tice, Al Horford, excellent Gortat screeners. That is the Gortat screen. Another concept we talk about specifically as it relates to Nikola Jokic is court mapping. Court mapping is simply knowing where everyone is on the court and the tendencies of those players based upon NBA concepts. So here's an example. Let's say this is Nikola Jokic with the basketball. And this is two Nuggets players going into a high split. Again, a split is just when two off-ball players go to screen for each other. Let's say that this is Reggie Jackson. And Reggie Jackson sets a screen on Christian Brown, and Christian Brown cuts to the basket. Nikola Jokic has mapped the court. He knows this help defender is not really involved in the play. He's reading what these two defenders are doing. He also knows that as this cutter cuts to the basket, chances are this help defender, because he's been taught this way, is going to help on this cut. Whether it is a scoring cut or not, he's going to help. He has awareness of this cut. So court mapping is simply, I know this guy's gonna be open. I'm gonna make this skip pass for a three. Peyton Watson three. That's court mapping. It's simply knowing where everyone is on the court. Another example of that from Nikola Jokic. Nikola Jokic in a post up right here against the New York Knicks. Josh Hart right here as a help defender. Aaron Gordon in the dunker spot in this area. Josh Hart coming from the baseline side on a double. Nikola Jokic knows that Aaron Gordon is in the dunker spot, assuming he can get inside position. He just makes an over-the-head pass right to Aaron Gordon for a layup. That's court mapping, spatial awareness. So a flood typically happens on a wing isolation. So let's say this is Jason Tatum. He's got a clear side. He's the offensive player. He's the O. He's got a clear side on offense. And let's say the other Boston players are all either at the top of the key or on the weak side, which we explained in a prior episode. Flooding simply means that the low man, the man closest to the rim, floods the lane and comes across the lane. That is flooding right here. So now Jason Tatum, instead of being isolated alone against one defender, has a second defender. All the other defenders on the weak side then get in help position. But this is the guy right here who comes across the lane and floods. Boxes and elbows, again, sometimes the meaning of the concept is simply in the word. Uh, if you look at a court, typically uh, the lowest hash mark is a box. This part of the court on the lane, is these are called the elbows right here. So boxes and elbows simply means that the help defense is stationed at the boxes and elbows. So think about an isolation at the top of the key. Let's say, again, it's Jason Tatum. He's isolating at the top of the key against the defender. Boston is spread out, five out. These defenders are at boxes and elbows. I want to thank you guys again for watching and listening to Mind the Game podcast with LeBron James and JJ Redick. If you haven't already, please hit that subscribe button. Uh, we just recorded episodes five and six. Um, I'm biased, of course, but I think they're some of our best work yet. I saw something on, uh, <clears throat> on Twitter that TickPick is reporting that they've sold six times more Final Four tickets the yes. women's final I four saw that. and the men's final I four. I was thinking about earlier this year, uh, Ryan Rucco, mm -hmm. who I you know work with, of course, who's calling uh, South Carolina LSU, mm -hmm. had better ratings on a Thursday night versus a Miami Heat, Boston Celtics TNT mm -hmm. game. It feels like uh, there's a surge in popularity right mm -hmm. now, mm -hmm. even more so for the men's, you know, than the men's game. Than the men's the, the, game. The yeah. women's basketball, whether it's WNBA, but particularly, yeah, yeah. particularly women's college. college. Yeah, yeah, Why do you yeah. think that is? I think, I think there's obviously there's a lot of factors that goes into to, to We're everything. theorizing yeah. here, by the way. Yeah, we're theorizing. We're just theorizing. But I personally think that 
there's two things. Obviously, the obvious one to me is the transfer portal. I think there's too many guys that are leaving colleges, leaving programs, and it's just hard to keep up with a lot of guys. You know, so if I'm a if if I'm a kid that goes to the you know if I'm a fan and I my team is is Connecticut or or Baylor or you know Duke or North Carolina and the kids are now you know they're leaving one year in or two years in in a transfer portal you know you like your pop you know your 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 fandom of that particular player on your favorite program it automatically dwindles it goes down so I think that that has something to do with as far as the popularity and 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 the excitement of why you may want to watch the the women's uh, college game more than the men's. But I also think the number one thing is in in women's sports compared to the men, we have the ability to go to the NBA right after our freshman year. In the women's game, you have the ability to build your legacy and build your and build your, your, your rapport and brand with that fan base, with that community. Caitlin Clark, I mean, back in the day when it was like Diana Taurasi and Sue Bird, Samika Holescloth, you know, Candace Parker, you know, you're watching these girls, they're doing it, Kelsey Plum at Washington. You, you're watching these girls year after year after year continue to grow. You watch it. You watch any girl. I mean, there's not much going on in Connecticut besides the Huskies. So when you get a, 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 a popular basketball player, which is the most popular sport in the world, I'm going to stick by it. I know football fans will rebuke my comment, but I believe that. But you get a, a, a woman to stay on campus three, four years, I think that has a lot to do with the popularity of their sport. It gets to something Rich Paul said to me. He was talking about NBA players and the scrutiny that uh, the great ones face now in the social media area, era. But he said to me, there are no more icons. Yeah. And when I think about men's college basketball, there are no more icons. And I think the two yeah. reasons you mentioned, one and done, transfer portal are a big part of that. Yeah. We'll go down the list. Since the one and done era, look, listen to this shit. Yeah. This is some of the names of women's college basketball players. And a lot of these players have won the Wooden Award. Candace Parker, and some of them have won it more than once. Yeah. Maya Moore, Brittany Griner, yeah. Brianna Stewart, Asia Wilson, Aaliyah Boston, Sabrina, Sabrina Unescu, Kelsey Plum, Caitlin Clark, Angel Reese, yeah. Juju Watkins, who's at USC. Yeah. That's just to name a few. Yeah. And I, I feel like that, as much as I love the team aspect of basketball, period, I think the women's game right now, particularly in college, has more icons. Yeah, I mean, when I was growing up watching college basketball on Big Monday, you had Allen Iverson at Georgetown, you had Kerry Kittles at Villanova, you had Ray Allen, Ray Allen. At, at Connecticut, yeah. you had uh, uh, John Wallace at Syracuse. These are all on Big Mondays. You know, there's no more, you, was, you spent four years at Duke. There's no more J.J. Reddicks or Shane ba Shane Battier came back. Yeah. He came back when he was already, he's going to be a lottery. He came back for his senior year. He's like, I'm coming back. Like, th those are the icons that we're talking about. Those are the college icons that you, that you watched. Yeah, you watched because you had a love for, you know, that program. But you also watched because they had certain icons or certain uniforms. Like, you know, I used to watch North Carolina back in the day. Ed Coda, he didn't sniff the NBA, but the he was but so. You knew who he I was. fucking loved Ed yeah. Coda in college. Yeah. I love Ed Coda, Shaman Williams, that that team that they had. You know what I'm saying? Like I love Cincinnati. You know what? What uh, uh, Logan and Ruben Patterson. You know, and Kenyon Martin, all those guys. When and then when Kenny Satterfield stepped in, Demar Johnson. It was like, I don't know where. It, it kind of like. <laughs> I remember as a kid watching that. Like I want, I wanted to, when I was growing up, I wanted to go to Cincinnati because of the uniforms and because of how, because of hugs. And then I got a little older, and I wanted to go to North Carolina because of the uniforms and because, you know, Ed Coda and his ability to pass the ball. Like I was like, oh, that's insane. Like, like you, you never want to go to Duke. Fuck no, man. <laughs> Fuck no, I never wanted to grow up and go to Duke. I already told you this. <laughs> my, my, 
my sophomore. Now, yes. Now, my, yeah, now, 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 yes. now that you know K. Now that, now that I know, you know K, K is my fucking guy. Yes, my, my, so, my sophomore year, uh, <laughs> they started recruiting me right at the end of this the, the high school season. And so they my season ends, and they say, you can come to senior night. It's yeah. Chris Carowell's senior night. It was against Carolina. I go. This is, I mean, I'm a Duke fan. Right. I'm a dream come true. Right. So I go, and... Um, had a great time. Duke wins. You know, I meet Kay for the first time. Spent some time with Wojo. Wojo takes me around campus yeah. or whatever. Like a month and a half later, I'm at the first uh, big Nike AAU tournament, which was Boo Williams. Yeah. We hosted the first tournament in Virginia. And we get to the championship game, and I'm sitting with my teammates. And you know how you used to wear shorts underneath your shorts? Of course. <laughs> you wore shorts underneath of your shorts. Of that course. particular day... I had decided to wear some Carolina shorts. So all I want to do in life is go to Duke, but I, I like the Carolina blue color. So I'm rocking these Carolina blue shorts and who fucking walks up okay, and sits so, next to me. No, Wojo does. Oh, He's like, what the fuck are you doing, dude? I was like, there goes my chance. trying to kill everything. There goes my chance. Uh, real quick, I just want to wrap this up, but like Cameron Brink, who uh, star player for, for Stanford, mm -hmm. she said up, she had a quote. She said, I keep seeing videos of people saying, I can name five women's basketball players in college, but not men. That's so funny and such a crazy shift. I, I want to say overall, the women's game, we have legends still playing mm -hmm. and a bunch of future stars. The game is in such a good place. Mm -hmm. I want to make one last point because I always think about time and progress, right? Mm -hmm. uh, first time there was men's basketball in the Olympics was 1936. First time there was women's basketball was 1976. The NBA started in 1951. It was the NBL before that in 1946. Mm -hmm. WNBA was founded in 1996. The first women's nationally televised game was 1979. Think about that. It was the AIAW. Mm. They were going against uh, Larry Bird and Magic, mm. right? NCAA tournament for women didn't start until 1982. Think about the NBA, mm -hmm. right? Still on tape delay yep. in the 1980s. Finals games, playoff games. It's just time and progress. That's it. It's inevitable. Mm -hmm. It's inevitable. These players are so talented. It's only going to get better. It's only going to get better. So this surge we're seeing, it's the trend. It's the trend. It is the trend. And I'm all for it because I love the sport, men or women. I love it. And talking about role. I, I want to be, uh, I want to be clear on this. No, I, I do. I want to be clear. <laughs> that on is this. our show. Our show is very clear. <laughs> I want to be clear on this because I feel like there are parts of basketball mm -hmm. to casual fans. Yeah. And actually, you know what? Fuck that. We're all guilty of this. Yeah. We are guilty of this. Where we can watch a game. Yep. And say. Oh, that guy was awesome. And, you know, chances are he, he was awesome. Yep. If we all think he was awesome, he was awesome. And there's this other part of us that's like, that guy was a bum. Mm -hmm. I, and there's the box score watchers there, the box oh, score watchers. Oh, yeah, we know yeah, the yeah. box score watchers. And I go. made the point the other night on uh, your game with the Warriors. I said, I think screen assist should be in the box score. I'm well aware that we can track screen assists that is an official tracking stat. Mm -hmm. I want it to be a box score stat. Yeah. Because it's like, it goes back to role. Basketball, for some reason, we all have these like interchangeable roles at times. Mm -hmm. Other sports, we don't. I agree. So if Jason Kelsey doesn't allow a sack and has a couple pancake blocks, then he was awesome. Nobody's saying... Fuck, Jason, why didn't you catch a pass today? Right. Why didn't you score a touchdown, Jason? Yeah, yeah, for sure. We need screen assist. For sure. Like, can we capture how good Rudy Gobert is if we had screen assist in a box score? If Steph goes off for 42 and Draymond has seven assists, seven rebounds, seven points. And seven screen assists. And seven screen assists. Does that better capture how good Draymond Green is? Yes. Because his impact don't always show up in the box score, like you're saying. Hockey assists. Yeah. Guys that pass, pass open decent shots for great shots. Right. Or understand what the pass, what the next pass is going to do. I'll give you a prime example right now. 
Let's hear it. Back to blitz and pick and rolls. Yeah. There's certain teams in our league that we know will blitz a pick and roll, try to get the ball out of D'Lo's hands, try to get the ball out of Austin's hands because they're you know, pretty damn good if you let them get a little, you know, get some space, get them, give them where they can see vision, whatever. A lot of teams have been trying to blitz us lately. The best play for them to make when you know that's happening with 80 setting the screen is the throw ahead pass. To the corner. Or, or, or to the wing. Or to the wing. On which, which depending on which, yeah. yeah. As soon as you come off and you have two guys on the ball, 80s diving, that means there's a two-sided on the same side that's going to tag 80, which you just drew up. Yeah. I can draw it up again. Yeah, draw it up again. <laughs> you want the throw-ahead pass to the slot. The throw ahead pass to the slot. Come in middle, yeah. Come in middle. It is the easiest play to recognize, and now you put the onus on the guy in the slot to make the proper read. Nine times out of ten, it's going to be the guy that's sitting right in front of him, right in the corner. You know, it's, it's, it's interesting, too, because you, you talk about the hockey assist in this play, and so as AD rolls here, these two guys have now committed to the ball, right? Yes. And the pass goes here. Yes. Sometimes it's it's not AD that's going to score either, right? It's like it's he can catch, yeah. and then he hit here, or maybe it's a skip pass all the way over. Yeah. I, I, I think basketball, in some ways, I don't want to simplify it, because as Devin Booker said a couple weeks ago to me, uh, there's certain people that are them ones. I was not one of them once, right? But there are certain people that have the ability, like Kevin Durant, or like Devin Booker, or like Jalen Brown, to Kyrie Irving, Luka, whoever. You know who I'm talking about. The mm -hmm. guys that can score efficiently one-on-one. -on -one. And as we've gotten into this, like, super analytical phase of the NBA, there are coaches who are reading time and score. They're reading the shot chart, the turnovers, and they're saying, I'm going to manage this game, and as long as I'm up 7 to 10 points in this situation, I'm not going to blitz. I'm not going to put two on the ball, and I'm going to live with whoever going 12 for 24 for 29 to 32 points. But you know what? I'm not going to get in rotation. I'm not going to put two on the ball. I'm not going to give up offensive rebounding. And I think that's really interesting. It is. How far did I get the Hawks? <laughs> What's wild about that is they, they blitzed more than anybody in the league, and then they decided not to blitz. And Luca had 70. I know. Anyways, my point is, my point is there are certain guys that can do it and you live with it. And there's there are certain plays and actions yeah. that cause a reaction and you get two on the ball. The whole thing with defense, at least to me right now, is can we stay out of rotation? Can you stay out of rotation? And what are you or what are you willing to give up? Yeah. It's not what you're willing to stop. You can't stop. Yeah. The players and in, in certain teams and the coaching now. It's very, it's super, super diversified and super tricky. And they're always trying to, they're, they're just reading to see what you do. Okay, that's how they played it. Oh, okay, we got a counter for that. There's a counter for that. So it's not what you're willing to stop. It's what you're willing to give up. If we go into a game and say, hey, this team, they fucking shoot the three out of high clip. They shoot 45 threes a game, 50 threes a game. So let's take away, try to take away the threes and let's live with the mid-range. Don't foul and put them on the free throw line because we know that's the easiest bucket you can get. And let's try to take away the threes. But that's not switching when it comes to a great player. Because you know what happens when you switch and you play against a great player, you're going to end up in fucking rotations you're anyways. End up in rotation anyways. Yep. 100%. It's not switching. Yep. It's building a defense that keeps everyone at home, keeps yeah. the big on the big, the guard has to either navigate, am I going under, am I going over, depending on who the point guard or the two guard is. And he has to work his ass off for that game and his minutes that he's guarding that player. And everyone has to just be ready on the backside. Obviously, case of emergency, you know, guy fucking falls or 
you know, something breaks down, the big is up too high, and he let the roller get behind him. Shit changes, obviously. By the way, I, I want to just show you that real quick. That's your second shot. <laughs> She's so close. Holy close. shit. Isn't that wild? There's nine guys inside the, the three-point There's nine line. guys within 12 feet of each other. <laughs> yeah, it's wild. We'll, we'll make sure this ends up on the video. That's crazy. Uh, you, mentioned, you mentioned the Luka game against Atlanta. I, I, we actually had him right after, and we talked about uh, what I think, we're going to do a play breakdown here, what I think is like the most unstoppable and ridiculous cheat code in the NBA, if you can time it right. This is you against the Milwaukee Bucks um, in 2020, in March of 2020. Oh, I already know what it is without even watching it. What, what happens on this play? The fucking Gortat screen. <laughs> the Gortat screen. <laughs> the fucking Gortat screen is the most unstoppable. It's wild. Play. Like you said, if you can time it right, it can't be stopped. I scored a few times in that game. One, I got an and one in the first half versus Brooke. In the second one, I, just, I hostaged. You call it put a him hostage in jail. Said, I see put him in jail. put him in jail. But some people yeah. call it a hostage yeah. dribble. I mean, you know, yeah. So you, you, come, you come over, they chase over yeah, the screen, yeah. you put them on your back, yeah. and then you just kind of hostage dribble. And now, and now I'm waiting in that clip. Yeah. As soon as I saw JaVale yeah. gore tied it, I, that's when I took off. Yeah. Luca does it. I, they, they teach it. Yes. J Kid and his staff, they teach that. Yeah. They teach it. The um, my favorite part about that clip, by the way, so Martian Gortat was a teammate of mine in Orlando. When he was in Washington with John Wall, <laughs> he started doing this. I actually asked him about this today. Yeah. Where did he on, on the flight here? Right. I was like, hey bro, I'm gonna talk about the Gortat screen. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be like, where did you get it from? And he's like, ah, just reading angles. You know, Stan really helped me in understanding the game and I came up with it myself. And then he said he has three other screening angles that he hasn't shared with anybody. <laughs> so I'm like, I got to see this shit. But anyways, Martian Gortat would run this with John Wall. Yeah. If you remember, a lot of teams would go under John. In exactly. Big Wall, right? So if as they would set the pick lower and lower, they would keep switching the pick lower yeah. and lower yeah. or flipping the pick lower and lower, John would eventually get over the top. And the big... Right, John was treated as a non-shooting yeah. threat. We got to protect the rim against John Wall. The big would be so far back that Martian, instead of rolling to the basket, would just go run right into the big. Yeah, and just run. And then, you know, he would either run straight into him with his back, with his back towards his offensive player, or act like he's on a fake post up and then just turn around. Yeah. It's so amazing that Martian has a he has this, like, Martian yeah. Gorsh Gortat has yeah. this. Yeah, you know, you have, like, the, yeah, you have, like, the Carl Malone area. Yeah, yeah. You know, you have, like, like certain things that, that we have in our yeah. game. Iverson you know, Cut. The Iverson Cut. Yeah. The Iverson Cut. Yeah, the Iverson Cut. There's one more. There's a couple more. My favorite, though, part about that particular clip, if you really slow down and watch it, you had to have just said, Javel Gortat screen. He doesn't even look at you or the ball. At all. He sets the pick. He yeah. kind of out of the corner of his eye sees that you have him in jail. Have him in jail. And he runs, and he runs directly right to Brook. Right to Brook. Yeah. Right to Brook. I see it now on drives, too. It's not just in pick and roll. Yeah. Draymond, Draymond does it all the time. Yeah, Draymond did it on me the other night, but he actually grabbed my fucking arm. It was, he wouldn't <laughs> fucking let my arm go. <laughs> he had me in jail and put the handcuffs on me. It's yeah. great. It's, no, it's great. It's, it's great. great. So anyways, look for that. Yeah, look for that. Look for that. And again, it goes back to you, you dunk the ball. You dunk the ball. But JaVel McGee is going to get no credit on that. That should be the assist. You're absolutely 100%, 100%. right. 100%. You're absolutely right. But that's sacrifice. Um, going back to spacing. I love just weaving in and out of this shit. Going back to spacing, though. Yeah, I feel like a 9-11 Turbo S right now. <laughs> yeah. Just weaving out of traffic. Not all spacing is created equal. And by that, I mean... You can, have, you can play five out, right? You can play five out. You can keep the paint clear. Yeah. But not every player, hey, as you said earlier, out. by the way, which is important, not everybody has to be a 40% shooter. No. You have to be a threat from three. Yeah, You yeah, have absolutely. to be a threat. Draymond plays in spacing. Yeah. Sean Marion played in spacing. You know, there's certain guys that plays in spacing. And 
but it's your IQ that creates the space. Draymond's biggest asset offensively is being able to know that guys are going to sag off him because they're daring him to shoot. And Draymond's smart enough to say, you idiots, I'm not going to shoot the ball. Y'all playing so far off me, so when I catch it in space, I'm going to find one of my deadly two guys, Clay or Steph, and I'm going to DHO to those guys and get a clean hit, and because you're so far off me, you're not going to be able to contest. And then when you run up out of control, I know that my greatest asset is my pocket pass game four on three. Yeah. That's playing in space. Right, the over, this is like, this is the Duncan Robinson, this is the Kyle Korver, this oh was, of God. course, Ray Allen. You Absolutely. get to that dribble handoff, you're the, you're the big. Yeah. You've, you've sagged off DeAndre Jordan with me. Yeah. You've sagged off of him. I've created the separation. DeAndre's coming to a dribble handoff with me. Oh, shit. Yeah. There's the overreaction. And with Steph and Clay, there's probably not a greater overreaction. Yeah. Draymond gets behind. I mean, when, and when you have a guy like you saying, you have those guys that can play in the pocket and understand it. Bam, out of Bayou. You know, we played them in the finals. He, when you have Tyler Hero and Duncan Robinson and those guys flying off, there has to be some chain of reaction. Yeah. There has some, to be. There's this, uh, uh, there's this concept. That's not a concept, really. But uh, my friend uh, who coaches for the Timberwolves put up these uh, lists of attributes for basketball athleticism. And <laughs> look, I, I'm not going to go through all the physical ones. You can guess them. You know, vertical plane, yeah. balance, coordination, yeah. uh, agility, all that stuff. Uh, but the cognitive side of it, um, which I – think we touched on it quite a bit in episode one, but I, there's one in particular I want to talk about today. So uh, the cognitive side of it is pattern recognition, spatial awareness, which is court mapping, yep. anticipation, cognitive load, mental bandwidth, essentially your process. Your process speed, right? yep. So the, the court mapping part, I think, is really interesting. So there's, there's a bunch of guys that do it, I think, at a higher level than anyone else. And the analogy I would use is if you were to... Um, to get a new car, and let's say this new car, it was like 19, no, we'll say 2009, okay. before Apple CarPlay, before Android Google Play. You remember you used to get a car mm -hmm. and the map would have to download. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so there's some guys, they the map only gets 30% <laughs> downloaded. There's some guys, maybe it gets 60% downloaded. There's a lot of guys that I think are at like yeah. 80 or 90%. Yeah, yeah. The map has been downloaded <laughs> very nice so that you can actually very nice start the car and get most places yeah. you want to go. Yeah. <laughs> and then there's like a handful of guys. The map has 100% downloaded. Right. And they've mapped the whole court. Their pattern recognition mm -hmm. is a 10 out of 10. Their anticipation is a 10 out of 10. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, is a game changer. You, we were talking about the, the not all spacing is creating equal. You remember in your game the other night against the Warriors, Steph's over in the corner. Gary Payton is in the left wing, and Steph is pointing at him, right? Ball's all the way on the right side, all the way in the right corner. And Steph is pointing at him, pointing at Gary Payton. Because his man is all the way in the middle of the paint. So he what? knows if you swing it to Gary Payton. The DHO happens. DHO. And he came off, faked the three, resurfaced, shot it. And one, Rui Hachimura talks shit to D-Lo. Yeah. It's part of the reason I don't... It, again, it's personnel-based. I, I talked to my teammates today. About that? About that. About that, about Steph Curry. About In the film session. We have film today, and we, we watched clips of Golden State. We watched clips of the Hawks game that we just had our last two games. There was a clip where we gave up way too much space to Clay. We got caught. Looking at the ball in the air, the ball finds the ball in the post to one of the Golden State Warriors. And for a split second, we have one of our guys looking at the ball. And as soon as that happened, Steph set a rip on Clay and he gets a three. The next clip we show, we show I had Steph in transition and Steph cuts back door. And I'm body on body. I didn't fucking look at the ball the whole time. And I know that goes against every coach. Yeah. Ball, you basket, see the ball, uh, see the ball. The ball is the problem. The ball is not the problem with Steph Curry. He's the, he's, <laughs> he's he's the, the fucking he's problem. The problem. <laughs> Steph is most dangerous when he doesn't have the ball, yeah. which is not, it's not many guys 
all time in our league that's most dangerous without the ball. Yeah. I'm telling them, listen, guys, I've been in more than enough wars with those guys. More than enough. I understand it. So I get it. I get it. I come from a different point of view, POV. But when Steph decides to cut inside the lane, don't relax. He's coming back up. Right. Yeah. He's coming back up. But you have to have, that's reps and reps and reps and reps of actually guarding something that's uncomfortable. Guarding Steph is uncomfortable. And the problem with our guys in our league, they're not comfortable with being uncomfortable. Mm. And that's why Steph and Golden State will always be relevant because they play an uncomfortable style of play. Do you, do you hate that? I, I hate it when you don't have the person there to match it. <laughs> I just used the word hate. Uh, I hate it. Uh, going back to that Gary Payton play, though. What's, I know exactly the play you're talking about. No, I know, but, I, no, I but hold on. Again. But this is, I, so there's an anomaly to this, yeah. of course. I really hate the dunker spot. I'm not going to make the same mistake as episode one. So. It's all good. No, no. We're... <laughs> I really hate the dunker spot. <laughs> I do. I think there's a time and place for it. I think there's a time and place Fuck for it. Fuck with the spacing? Yeah. Obviously. Obviously. Yes. Obviously. Like, I, like, I like when I'm watching games or I'm watching film uh -huh. and I see no one in the paint. Yeah. So think about it this way. If Aaron Gordon was always in the dunker spot, and they go to their five-out splits. Yeah. They throw it to Jokic. They start running the back screen to a slip. He's going to be in the way. He's going to be in the way, okay. right? There's a time and place. When okay, you, okay. When, I like that. There's a time and place for the dunker spot. Time and place. 70-30? 80-20? I would say 70-30. 70-30. But on that team. 75-25. On that team, it's a different thing yeah, because, of, because of Jokic yep. and the court mapping. Yeah, court mapping. Yeah, for sure. There's a play... From, from March 2nd that I love. End game, you know what they're running, two man. Yep, two man. Jokic crosses the court on the right side. Correct. Jamal Murray's got the ball on the left side. They're gonna go to that high pick and roll, Murray to his right hand. Correct. And Jokic, I think it was Peyton Watson, he's like. Stay on that no, other no, side. No, no, he's like, go, go yeah. to the right corner. Yeah, so Peyton right Watson corner. was in life, well, left wing goes to the right corner. Yep. They get to their two man. It eventually ends up with Jokic. Gordon's doing cat and mouse on the baseline. Yep. And he spins. And it literally looked like a and shot. He's about the shot. And he does like this. Yeah. And lob dunk, right? Lob dunk. Yeah. That is court mapping. It is. Because he knew getting that guy over there, yep. he knew getting that guy over there yep. would make you have to make the tough decision. Yep. Do I help on his spin? Do I let him score? Yep. Or do I stay home on Aaron Gordon? Yep. And, it helps. and then it's the anticipation, the cognitive load, all that stuff. Yeah, so I mean, I saw a, a stat on on Jokic last year, and, and, and I, I don't know the exact number, but in the finals, in in, in the finals versus Miami, he, he shot like seventy percent from the free throw line in, like catching the ball at the free throw line, either yeah this yeah. or floaters when he catches in the pocket, like seventy four percent. That's insane. So when he turns. And he's going to this, you're thinking, okay, let me try to get a contest. Meanwhile, he has Aaron Superman Gordon flying in from the corner. By the way, give credit to Aaron Gordon. Absolutely. Because he's figured that out, that Absolutely. part of it out. The reason I don't, I don't normally like the dunker spot, though, is because I think what Gary Payton did and what Ben Simmons did, and to an extent when, in L.A., when we ran five out, we called it delay. When we ran delay, we would have Ben or Blake at the top and DJ in one of the slots. And mm -hmm. then he's screening for off the ball for Jamal, for me, yep. for CP, whatever. Mm -hmm. It's just harder to guard to me. Yeah. Um, I this mean, Aaron is Gordon again, unlocked, he unlocked everything for-, for 100%. Yeah, for them. This is again, I like terrible. Your, I, like your, I like your courts. It, as the more, different courts, you know, depending on where we are. The more wine I've had, the worse <laughs> these courts have got. All right, I'm gonna put a dunker spot guy. That is the dunker spot guy. Okay. All right, so you're an ISO on the left wing. Yep. I'm very curious about this. Yep. And, and if you don't want to give away secrets, that's fine. <laughs> Obviously, if you look at, uh, fuck it, I'll troll. If you look at uh, 1980s, 1990s, right, and you had an ISO on the left wing, this is what you're looking at, right? Yeah, yeah. There's no 2-9. You're no, not no, coming no, over. You can't, like, you can't move. You can't you're move. Literally right there. Can't but move. 
uh, in today's NBA. This guy can yeah, two nine all the way over two it, nines all yeah. the way yeah, strong. But let's say he itself. just floods all the way. Yep. Let's say he floods all the way. This guy moves inside. Yep. Okay. So now you're looking at essentially defense, 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 defense plus the guy in the yep. ball. Here's Boxes the and elbows. Yeah. Mm -hmm. On the left wing. Yep. I hate it. I don't like it. I don't. What is your <laughs> What is your sort of uh, checklist here on this? Depends on what the clock is. Okay. Obviously, if I don't, if I have more time in the shot clock, then I'm going to rearrange that lineup. Meaning, I'm sorry, not lineup, alignment. Alignment, yeah, yeah. I'm going to rearrange the alignment to, to make it better for not only me, but for the team. I don't like catching on the wing and sitting on the wing and allowing a defender X5 to come over and tilt, strong side, cleanse itself, and just stay there. X4, X3, or X2, get to sit inside the big on the other side, and now you got the box and the elbows covered. If I have enough time, I'm going to send one of my strong, one of my best shooter on the floor to the strong corner. Strong corner. So now, if they want to tilt strong side, I create the three on two. I want to create the three on two. It'd be very difficult. So, so just to be clear on that, you want to create the three on two. So by sending the top guy, essentially, to the strong to side, the strong your, your side, it, you want to now get middle. Yes. Create a two, a two, a two on the ball. Now you've got a three and on if two. if that big wants to stay on the strong side that I was isolating, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I got too much room to work with on that side for my teammates. Yeah. And it's not about for me. It's about creating the, 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 the advantage on the other side. There's not much advantage when I'm sitting on the wing and I have four guys staring at me. Yeah. If it's short clock, obviously my job is to tell the big that's being, you know, in the paint, in the dunker, you got you to gotta duck in, get to the middle of the rim to make him guard you. So when I do swing, we do have an advantage on the other side, but I don't like that alignment. I'm more of a 3-1 guy. When I have the ball, I like my, my best shooter in the strong corner, either if I'm on the left wing or the right wing, and I like a three-line assembled on the other side. The you guy, want to get that, the flood guy the fuck out of there, yeah, basically. Yeah, fuck out of there. And I like a guy down in the, in the and I know you don't like the dunker, but I like him down, and then a guy in the corner, guy on the slot. But No, 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 hold on, hold on. I will say this. On a left wing or right wing ISO or post up, it's I got good. no problem with the dunker. It's good. Because if, you're, if, you're, if no one's at the basket in that spot, if you're the only guy on the side of the court, right, right, right. and everybody's around the three-point line, then yeah, everybody can yeah, help. Yeah, everybody can. There's no you space have to in, put yeah, yeah. some pressure yeah, yeah, on the rim to. with the dunker in yeah, that yeah, situation. Sure. I'm talking about balls up top, either in the right high quadrant, left high quadrant, or it's the top pretty of bad. The key. It's pretty bad space in there. Yeah, that's yeah. all. That's I agree. About. It's pretty bad space, and I agree. All right, we did the Gore top play. I, I want to go through two more plays, and we're, 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 we're gonna we're gonna we'll add these to whatever episode we. We decide we want to add him to. Um, all right. So the one specific play I want to go through with you is the block in Game Seven. Okay. Of 2016. Okay. Take me through what proceeded on the offensive end to your mindset in that chase down. If if my mind is serving me right, both teams can score. Three, three, four, three minutes, three, four minutes of game, of actually game time. So when you're in the game, it actually feels like it's fucking 25, 30 minutes. Um, I think it was 89, 89 at the time, if I'm not mistaken. And at that point in time, I felt like Kyrie could get us the best shot. And um, if I'm not mistaken, I believe Kyrie drove, got a great look, shot up a floater. And I'm sitting in the corner by their bench. I'm opposite of Kyrie. I'm, I'm sitting I'm sitting in the corner by their bench. In my head, I said, if I'm correct with the, with the trajectory of the ball, what I'm seeing, I got to get my ass back. Because Iggy's going to be on a sprint. Steph's going to be on a sprint. And we're outnumbered. Because I'm below the free throw line. Tristan's below the free throw line. Kyrie's shooting the ball. He's below the free throw line. And all I can see is all I see is, is swish. They are. I said, I gotta get back. So as soon as the ball, when the ball is missed, I didn't, I didn't, if I was to follow my coach's orders or coach's orders, you're supposed to get back on the race. On the release. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On the release. Get back on the release. I did not get back on the release. I did not get, I didn't start to actually 
get back until I actually saw it was a miss. But in my mind, I could see the ball feeling like it was going to be a little long. I just hard ass, man. I just hard ass. And when I'm running, I think, if I'm not mistaken, I don't know who it was that I kind of like, kind of run around. I don't know who it was. I don't know if it was a Golden State player or, or one of our guys. I kind of had to run around or, or, or move around because I was in the left corner and Iggy Sider on the right side. But when I run it, all I'm telling myself, I'm like, swish, do not foul him. So you can ask any of my teammates throughout the course of my career or throughout the course of that season, anytime that you see me trailing the play, all I need is a little adjustment from the offensive player, and I promise you I'll track it down. Do not fucking foul. Do not fucking foul. I told the guys all year, if you see me hauling ass, just make him, instead of just going in for a layup, make him change it a little bit, just a little bit. And, and Switch gets a lot of shit today right? because of the blunder he had yeah. the following year or two years later, whatever the fuck it was, of not understanding the, the time and score, whatever the case may be. He executed that shit to perfection. He made Iggy change his shot just a little bit, and that's all I asked. It's interesting because I went up with both hands too. By the way, I was ready. No, you hit the you I, hit the rim with your left. Hand. I was ready yeah. for the reverse or the strong side, and I was like, if these fucking refs call goal ten, I might get kicked out of this most important game of my life because it was still over two minutes, and they couldn't you couldn't review back then unless it was under two minutes because I knew I had got it clean. That's all I was telling myself. I said, I'm getting this shit. So many of your chase downs, by the way, is you you do your little run. You know, you, I'm just saying, bro. <laughs> I'm not I'm not an impressionist. But <laughs> you do your little run, uh, and then it's like the quick burst. You know what I mean? That was different, though. That was uh, that was like once you said, "Okay, I got to go get this." I was like, "Yeah, I've got." I don't have time. A little window. Yeah. To get there. Yeah. It was different. Like the last leg of the fucking four by one relay were like. Fucking the same boat. I was like, I gotta fucking go. All right, I got one more play for you. Let me pull it up real quick. We could literally do this shit all day, bro. <laughs> you not on the Wi Fi here? They didn't give you your Wi Fi? I just hit play on that. I already know what the fuck this play <laughs> is, you motherfucker. <laughs> by the way, by the way, you fucked what me happened? up. What happened here? What happened here? What happened here is that I didn't know that your ass could go and stop and go like this. What the fuck? I didn't know that you had that in your, in your arsenal. The little... Yeah, the little rap. Yeah, the little hezzy rap. Yeah, the hezzy rap. You fucking turned me all the way around. I'm, I'm serious when I say this. Like, I love the fact that you missed it. Thank you. I appreciate if it. If I had made that shot, <laughs> if I had made that shot, By I, way, would this have, I would have that highlight. Pinned on every social media account at the By very way, top. This of is my 94 account. 94 in overtime. In overtime. I know. How did you miss we won that? Like 104 98. We won that game. Y'all won that game? Yeah. 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 I turned all the way around. That was a, uh, I think that was a lockout year. Because, right. yeah, Shane was on the team. Yeah, Shane was on the team. Shane was on the team because he guarded me that game. He actually switched. He was on Ryan Anderson. He, yeah, he switched did. right before. Yeah, we that. got a fucking foul after that. He didn't. Yeah. Yeah, call for I've made that shot, man. It's, not, was, it's not a highlight. It's not a highlight. It's not a highlight. It should not it. be on YouTube. It should not be on YouTube. As you a know highlight. why it's on YouTube? Because who was it? Because it was against <laughs> fucking me. Everything is on YouTube. If it's done against me, no matter if it's a highlight or not, everything. Uh, I'll take half of it. I'll take. I'll take like a half credit. You, you, you do know how that I create super teams, though, right? What's up? <laughs> Cheers, man. This is good. <laughs> I'm, glad, I'm glad I didn't dive into that. So good. That was great. All right, we good? He say, okay, I get it. This motherfucker, oh, this motherfucker nice. He points at me. This motherfucker, he gonna get his. We can't stop him. This motherfucker, okay. He had his 15 foot shots and shit. Okay, all right, cool. But this <laughs> motherfucker, <laughs> this motherfucker ain't shit. <laughs> How does he have 18 points? I said, oh my god, that shit is so funny, man. Hey, 
Hey guys, thanks for listening. Thanks for watching Mind the Game podcast. If you like it, please hit that subscribe button. Thank you.